sellotape, uh, white paper, I've got some orange paper. I'm going to try and make it good. <laughs> I never try and, try and make my version of a thing good. I don't want mine to be, well, maybe not the best, but good. Uh, there we go. We having this is good. We're not having any YouTube problems this morning. It was an absolute write off trying to teach on uh, YouTube Live. It was really sticky. I've I've done it now, haven't I? I've cursed it. Maybe Facebook uh, YouTube was just having a bad couple of minutes. Okay, scissors, sellotape, three cans, paper. Oh yeah, spice jar. Paper, sellotape, spice jar, small twig or cocktail stick, play dough optional, orange paper optional, but I've brought one because, like I say, I want mine to be the best. Mine's always the worst, and your guys, it's always really good. And copious, copious notes. I'll just get these. There's so much to say. I mean, it is, it is a massive rocket, but I shouldn't be surprised that there was a lot to say. <laughs> right. Yep. It's all good. Okay. Uh, I might just flip you around, you know. Oh, thank you, person who's liked this video. Have you just liked the fact that everything's working? YouTube is working. Mm. I won't speak too soon, but it, it seems to be working. Let's just assume that everything will be fine. Okay, should we get going? Oh, yeah, we better do, haven't we? You got all your stuff? Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. <laughs> you ready? I'm going to flip you. Hello, everybody. Hello. My name is Lara. This is Theory of Science. It's the show with the Lego story time where I tell you all about a thing that I've been researching this week. And this week, I've been researching Artemis One, which is not this, but this is actually an excellent model, which we are going to build together and talk about what Artemis One actually is. Um, let's, let's do something, first of all. Let's get making the model and while we do I'll tell you all about it. So if you've got a piece of white paper what I'd like you to do first is draw around one of your bean cans that you should have brought or, or any kind of can, I just like beans. Draw around the can, cut out a piece of white paper and then cut it in half so you've got a semicircle. Was that too much? Draw around the can, cut out the circle and then cut the circle in half. I'll do it with you. So <sighs> NASA is going to the moon again. Did you know this? I can't do it at that will just be too difficult. Uh, yeah, NASA's going on a new mission to the moon. So what, what Artemis 1 is, it's a test flight, so there's no people on it. But eventually, um, the aim is, that in a couple of years' time, human beings will walk on the moon again. It's the, the, the mission, eventually, is going to take the first female astronaut and the first astronaut of colour to the moon. So you could say, well, why has that not been a thing already? But let's just go with, yay, great. Obviously humans have been on the moon before. As far as I know, they were all white men. So it is a, a fabulous time to be alive, yay. Right, I've cut out my circle. So Artemis One, they've been trying to test flight this thing 
for ages and ages and ages and it just won't launch which is good for good and sensible reasons it has not launched like it was supposed to launch as i speak it's thursday it was supposed to launch on tuesday right i have a paper circle now i'm going to cut it in half okay you can just get rid of one of the circles we just need a semicircular paper uh yeah so it's thursday today it was supposed to launch on tuesday and it didn't launch because a storm was coming so they had to just get it all back inside or whatever you do with a rocket to protect it um and it, one time its engine was too hot it's just constantly being in the news that it's about to launch and then it doesn't launch but this is good for us it means you've got time to learn about it okay so cut a little piece of paper once you've got your paper semicircle and what i want you to do is turn your paper semicircle into a cone so basically glue the like if you fold it in half i suppose you could do that and then sellotape the flat edges together so that the circular part of your semicircle is now the base of a cone see what i'm doing there yeah you get it right so i'll just do that so i'll read you out what the nasa website said because i found it deeply confusing when i started trying to research this okay if you if you look at what is artemis one then what it says on the nasa's website is all eyes will be on the historic launch complex 39b when the orion spacecraft and the spanch launch system brackets sls rockets lift off for the first time from nasa's modernized kennedy space center in florida artemis one will be the first in a series of increasingly complex missions to build a long-term human presence on the moon blah 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 so many things there the orion spacecraft and the space launch system are lifting off that's the rocket and then like they just start talking about Artemis 1. So what is what? Well, if you've made your little paper cone, what you've made there is the Orion spacecraft, the thing that the humans are going to live in as they journey to the moon. All right. So this is the model that we're going to make behind me. Um, all the, the be we're going to stack three bean cans on top of each other in it and put these things on the side. All the bean can stuff and the spice jar is all just to get the tiny little Orion space uh, capsule thing into space, like getting towards the moon. So all this eventually just falls away. We'll talk about this in a minute. The little cone that you've made is the only bit that the humans are going to live in. And the whole thing all together, the little Orion capsule and the big space launch system rocket jubbins all that together is the artemis one mission so it's the first time the space capsule and the rocket have all gone up in space together so they're sort of testing it as a whole thing and that's artemis one okay i was pleased to learn that i actually didn't know that um right so we better get making this big rocket thing so yeah the orion space capsule it can hold um i think six people for about 21 days sorry four crew members so it can hold four humans for 21 days and that's it and obviously there's loads of computers and stuff on board but we'll look at how that thing actually gets into space so if you've got three cans stack them on top of each other what we're going to make now is the <clears throat> the core stage this is kind of the world's tallest rocket it's the world's biggest core stage probably help if i show you i'll show you a picture nasa have got a beautiful picture on their website the problem is the rocket is so big that they can't fit the whole picture of the rocket on the website so we'll have to make a model instead. But here we are. So you've got a massive reflection of me. Um, but look, thank you, NASA, for making all this free to view. If you scroll down. So that's the crew module, right? The What they've called Orion at the top. And this is our spice jar we'll talk about later. And if you go down, you'll see that the, the kind of core of the rocket is pretty much basically a liquid oxygen tank with a liquid oxygen tank on top liquid hydrogen, liquid oxygen in tanks. And that's basically what our bean cans are. So stack your bean cans up. Um, and actually, while I'm talking, you could be, if you want to be making it look cool, uh, wrapping paper around it. I've got some orange paper and the rocket is orange. So, which I'll explain why in a sec. I'm gonna wrap some orange around here to make it look proper. Um, yeah, so we talk about fire a lot in theory of science, and we've talked about how to make fire, you need fuel, and you need uh, heat, and you need oxygen, right? Or something to, to oxidise to make the chemical reaction happen. So obviously when you burn a candle, what's happening is like the candle is the fuel, you add the heat, 
and the, the fuel reacts with the oxygen in the air, okay? But there's really not enough oxygen in the air to make the kind of chemical reaction that you want to get a rocket into space. So what they do is they turn hydrogen, which is very flammable, but hydrogen is a gas, they turn it into a liquid. And to turn gases into liquids, you've got to make them really, really, really cold. Um, and they also turn oxygen into a liquid, so compress it. Obviously, you can fit more oxygen in if it's a liquid into the tank. And then just before takeoff, they pump it um, into the engines and, and set it on fire. And the results are ludicrously powerful. So anyway, I've fast-tracked a bit. Um, these tanks are incredible because when you make hydrogen a liquid, hydrogen is a cryogenic. Cry you might have heard of cryogenic freezing. Cryogenic means you've got to make something really cold before it comes a liquid. The liquid hydrogen in the tank is minus 250 degrees Celsius. Minus 273 degrees Celsius is like the coldest that you could possibly get. So it's ludicrously cold. And well, I've, I've read a bit of the description of like what happens if this stuff escapes, because it's not good. Um, because liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen are both cryogenic, uh, they pose enormous technical ch challenges. Liquid hydrogen must be stored at minus 20, 250 degrees to keep it from evaporating or boiling off. It must be carefully insulated from all sources of heat. It's right next to rockets that are burning and obviously friction from the air. We've looked at this in IGCC. Um, so they've got to insulate it incredibly carefully. It says metals exposed to extremely cold temperatures get very brittle. If you've ever seen metal that's maybe like been in the garden for a long time, got very icy, it does tend to be a bit sort of flaky. So a lot of people when NASA started using liquid hydrogen said, what, that is a terrible idea, like so dangerous, but it's also incredibly efficient. It's like the most efficient uh, fuel. You get the biggest thrust for the, the amount of fuel that you use. So they use it. Um, and yet, what do you get when you mix oxygen and hydrogen? So when, you see, when it eventually launches, you'll see all these clouds of kind of white smoky stuff billowing off. What is that? What do you get when you mix hydrogen and oxygen together? Hmm? You know this, right? You heard of H2O? Yeah, H2O, water, hydrogen particles plus oxygen particles. So what all that stuff is billowing onto the launch pad at takeoff uh, is steam. It's pretty good, eh? It's kind of... It takes a lot of energy to make a rocket, but that part of it is uh, very environmentally friendly. So that's nice. Right, I think we've taught all in this. Oh yeah, so the, the orange stuff. The reason it's orange is because that's insulation. So well done if you've wrapped some orange insulation around it to keep your hydrogen and your oxygen cold. Okay, but even that liquid hydrogen, which causes a ludicrously powerful uh, thrust, which makes the rocket take off, it's not enough to get a rocket of this size into the air you need more power more thrust so what they what comes in now is the solid rocket boosters which are these things on the side so they're easy to make let's just get a piece of white paper cut it in half and roll it into two if you're feeling fancy then uh, you can make it have like a little cone at the end how are we going to do that so i'm going to cut a bit of sellotape and just, like I say, I've cut a piece of paper in half and I'm just going to roll those into tubes. And then maybe I'll try and put a little cone at the top somehow. So the solid, ro solid rocket boosters um, are what they say. They're packed full of solid rocket fuel. It's actually uh, some kind of aluminium inside, which reacts with uh, some sort of oxidizer. I haven't looked into the detail. Um, but it's the solid rocket boosters on the side which provides 75% of the thrust needed to just get the rocket moving. Um, and their job is over in two minutes. It's so weird. All right, so I've rolled one of my tubes. So yeah, all this effort, and within two minutes of this thing getting into the air, these solid rocket boosters, basically like massive fireworks, have done their job, and they just fall into the sea. So you might have read about previous space missions that NASA have done, using something called the Space Shuttle. Um, on the Space Shuttle, here I have these two now, I'm gonna try and like snip a few lines into the top of, of my tube and see if I can make it into a bit more of a coney shape by taping sellotape to the top. You know what I mean? Like sort of, how does that work? I'm just gonna, maybe I should just 
No, I don't know. Try and get it a bit tubey shaped at the top because it is basically just a huge firework we're making now. Um, yeah, the space shuttle rocket boosters were designed to be reusable, whereas um, these rocket boosters are apparently not reusable because uh, just if you weren't going to reuse them, you could design them in a way that made them more efficient. There we go. I've, atten I've attempted to make one of them pointy. And now I'm just going to stick it to the side of my rocket. My space launch system. What a great name. Okay. So, have you got a cocktail stick? Because in a minute we need to talk about why there is a tiny little cocktail stick sticking out the top of my model. The, this cocktail stick is, uh, is representing something absolutely amazing. Like, probably my favourite bit of the rocket. All right, so I've got my solid rocket boosters on. I'm not going to make one of them pointy. You can while I'm waffling on. Here we go. So what's happening above? Let's have a look. There's a lot of bits that we're, we're kind of going to skim, to be honest. So let's go back to this diagram. Um, we've got our solid rocket boosters. We've got our enormous core. Um, we haven't done the rockets, the engines. There's like four engines on the bottom. I am i don't know. You could put the whole thing on like... Uh, bottle tops. I'm not going to try that because it's very heavy. But the engines are very important. That's where the liquid hydrogen and the liquid nitrogen get sent. And obviously they push off and that pushes the rocket into space. But let's go up a bit. So really we should wrap a neat piece of paper around the top of our bean cans to make it slope in a bit. This is the launch vehicle adapter. I'll click on so you can see. Basically its job seems to be to connect the bottom bit to the top bit, if I'm perfectly honest. I'm not going to go into more detail than that. <laughs> and then we've got the interim cryogenic propulsion, propulsion stage. That's an actual photo of it. We are going to be using um, a spice jar. There. So part of this spice jar is our interim cryogenic propulsion stage. So once this thing gets into space, like I say, two minutes after it's taken off, these solid rocket bo bo boosters just fall into the sea. Um, all the liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen, all this bit, its job is done in like 500 seconds. And then that too separates off and falls into the sea. So what you're left with is this interim cryogenic propulsion stage attached to the, um, the actual spacecraft itself. Um, and that is what ends up orbiting Earth. And then the interim, don't make me say it again, the interim bit sort of gives it a last boost, which will boost it out of Earth's uh, orbit and towards the moon. And then that bit falls off as well. Whew. So get a piece of Play-Doh. Let's talk about a cocktail stick. Try and squidge a bit of Play-Doh onto the very top of your spice jar. And stick a cocktail stick in it or a twig. There. And then if you've got your little Orion space capsule where all the people are, not in the test flight, but in the real thing, then you can plop that over the top. Yay! Come on! Ah, this is getting better every time. So what this little cocktail stick is, uh, this actually comes off after it's blasted into space as well. The cocktail stick, I'll show you on the photo, is the launch abort system. Come here. Oh, what uh, Guess what the launch abort system's doing? It's attached to the crew module, that's the Orion. Um, it's designed to just whisk the astronauts away if there's a problem. So it says here, it can activate in milliseconds to pull the spacecraft away from the rocket if a problem arises during launch or ascent. Uh, it can, it's got such a powerful motor, it can accelerate from zero to 500 miles per hour in two seconds. That's what our little cocktail stick is representing. Isn't that just gorgeous? So obviously we've got tanks full of very, very, very compressed hydrogen that if they get warm are just going to explode. This little stick here is attached to the thing that the astronauts are in. So if there's any kind of explosion, within milliseconds, it can go from being completely still to travelling at 500 miles per hour and it just takes them away to safety. I just love it. Thank you, little cocktail stick. I mean launch abort system so that too drops off once the rocket has disappeared um because it you know, won't be any use after that okay uh have we got everything oh yeah uh, there's a little bit on here say the lid of the spice jar was made by the european space agency it's nice isn't it look 
here we are. And this stays with the little Orion crew module um, because it's, it basically powers it. See, it provides propulsion, thermal control and electrical power. Um, so yeah, that's nice. It's, it's the powerhouse. It literally like helps it get around once all the rest of the rocket has fallen off. So well done, European Space Agency. Thank you for being a part of this. Right, I think, I think that's our rocket done. I think we can talk a, a little bit about what Artemis, like where it's going to go once it's got into space. Yeah, great. I've run out of, run out of room on my launch pad. I have put a post up on my Facebook page saying that if anyone's got any questions, uh, stick them there. Yeah, so look at that, two rockets now. Okay, so yeah, let's have a look at where it's going and then I'll tell you story time because I've been promising you for ages. I'm going to tell you a story about when a rocket went wrong and I haven't told you it yet. Okay, so here we go. <laughs> Thanks again, NASA, for the free images. Um, the green is it setting off, so obviously it starts here. It sort of slingshots around Earth because gravity is incredibly useful for getting rockets moving. And then it's going to go all the way to the moon and then it does something totally bizarre. It goes into sort of what we call retrograde motion. So it's, it's, going, to, it's going to orbit the moon in the opposite direction to how the moon is orbiting Earth. Okay, so if the moon's doing that around the Earth, then Artemis 1, well, Orion, I suppose, is going to be doing going the opposite way. So I, I believe it orbits the moon like that for six days. And then again, it uses the moon's gravity to slingshot it back to Earth. See, so it goes, green is it coming in, this gray is it orbiting the moon, and then eventually it comes in again and uses the moon's gravity to sort of slingshot it back pew, to Earth. You see, and you can see the little Orion capsule there. It's going to land in the sea, and they reckon, this is all hypothetical because it hasn't launched yet, but they reckon it's going to land within view of the rescue boat. That's how accurate this all is. You could just be on a boat in the middle of the sea and be like, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, ah, oh, there's the lander. Pew, they're going to go and pick it up. So there's no one on board, but there is a dummy on board because they're also testing, as well as all this stuff, they're testing a suit which will allow humans to survive in space before they get rescued. Like if there's any kind of problem, the human can just float in space in this suit and get rescued. So good, it just seems so much safer than many other rockets that have gone before it. On that note, let's do a story time about when NASA decided to do a kind of business model that meant making spacecraft really cheap <laughs> and see how that worked out. Right, just gonna get my story time notes. Here we are. Story time! Spacecraft gone wrong! Oh no! Images courtesy of NASA. <clears throat> so, Oops, sorry, Mars has fallen down. Wait up. Mars, sort yourself out. Okay, Mars is fine. It's the 1990s, yeah, and NASA has Viking probes on Mars, but it wants to learn more about the atmosphere on Mars and the weather on Mars. So 1998 and 9, the timing is perfect. Mars was very close to Earth. So NASA come up with the idea for two missions. The Mars Polar Lander is going to land on Mars's South Pole and dig for water ice with its little robot arm that you can see here. Um, and the Mars Climate Orbiter, right, the clues in the name, Orbiter, is going to be the first ever weather satellite to orbit a planet that isn't Mars, uh, that isn't Earth. And it's going to monitor the weather and the atmosphere of Mars. But it's also conveniently going to send communications to and from the polar lander. So, the Mars Climate Orbiter launches first to great excitement because everyone's always very excited aren't they when when rockets launch and everyone's very excited when they get to their destination the bit in the middle uh, all sort of typical people you know like non-astronauts are a bit like but of course if you're a scientist then that interim bit is very important the rocket doesn't just trundle through space of its own accord it needs people to be working on it so um 
things are happening down on the ground to keep it on track, right? Like many space vehicles, the Mars Climate Orbiter, the MCO, had reaction wheels that were spinning. I'm going to show you a picture to really bring this idea to life for you. Ooh, here's a reaction wheel. So it's spinning, spinning is often very good and stabilizing for rockets, you know, like how a very fast spinning top is stable. So this spinning meant that the MCO had something called angular momentum. You might have heard the word momentum. It's, it's like how hard it is to stop something. So if you're like running downhill and your two-year-old brother suddenly steps in front of you wanting a hug, you might explain what happened next by saying, it wasn't my fault. I had too much momentum. So angular momentum is like that, uh, but for things that are spinning. So the angular momentum of the MCO was constantly monitored during its journey and the numbers, all oh, vital numbers, important statistics, uh, were sent back to the scientists on the ground, to the ground computers, who used the numbers to essentially steer it, okay? So they'd take those numbers, they would do calculations, and then the thrusters on the rocket would be instructed to fire, not a real-life model, um, and, and that would change its course slightly. Fantastic. So there were four of these course corrections performed, um, and everything seemed to be going absolutely fine. Nine and a half months after its launch, the MCO arrived at Mars. And that's when the scientists started to notice that the numbers that they were looking at on their computers on the ground didn't seem to be matching where the spacecraft actually was. But regardless, it fired its main engine to enter the red planet's orbit and... <coughs> We never heard from it again. What happened? Well, it was 105 miles closer to the surface of Mars than it should have been. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so what might have happened is that it might have completely passed through Mars's atmosphere and begun orbiting the sun. Good on you, dude. Or you'll notice it's got a solar panel on it. That delicate little solar panel might have just been completely destroyed by Mars's atmosphere and uh, it, might have, it might have died a death. Let's imagine it's still going round the sun. So why did that happen? Uh, well, it turns out that the spacecraft was doing its calculations and making its adjustments using the metric system, you know, like meters, kilograms, but the computers on the ground were doing their calculations using the imperial system, inches, pounds, both ways of measuring distance and mass, giving very different results. So for example, like, this is a kilogram bag of sugar. If I said to you, I'm just going to have a drink, sorry. Mm. Seeing sugar reminded me that I have honey and lemon here. <coughs> if I said to you, can you put a kilogram bag of sugar into my shopping bag? And you misheard me and put a pound in, that would be almost like two bags of sugar instead of the one that I wanted. Because I asked you for a kilogram, but you put in a pound. Imagine if I did that four times, my bag would be like four kilograms heavier than it was supposed to be. So this is what happened. These tiny little mistakes added up and up and up and up. And eventually the spacecraft ended up miles away from where it should have been. Um, so this is the kind of mistake that a GCSE student could easily make on an exam paper. It's not the kind of mistake that usually causes the loss of a $125 million spaceship. Obviously, it was very embarrassing, and the press had an absolute field day. A New York Times article said the whole thing was super embarrassing, and NASA officials are checking to make sure the same error does not occur to the Mars Polar Lander, which is now en route to Mars. Well, I'm very happy to report that the same problem did not happen to the Mars Polar Lander. Uh, a totally different problem happened to that. It started to land, and we think what happened is its little legs popped out, ready for landing, but the computer thought that its little legs popping out was actually its legs hitting the surface of Mars, so it turned the engine off, but of course it hadn't reached the ground, so it just kind of plummeted to its death. So there's no, there's no Mars orbiter, and there's no polar lander. Um, but, but isn't the really beautiful thing here, the fact that humans are still working to go into Mars. Um, that was the end of NASA's sort of experiment where it decided that it would build lots of kind of relatively cheaper pieces of equipment and send them into space fast. And I'm happy to report that they're now making things incredibly expensive again, which I'm sure is a relief to everybody. The end. Thank you for watching, folks. I'm glad I got to tell you that story in Lego instead of just telling you the story. Much more interesting. Everything's better with Lego. Um, thank you so much for coming. That is the story of Artemis One. 
So hopefully when at some point, like soon, we see it launch, you'll be like, yeah, yeah, I understand what's going on now. Um, if you're enjoying these shows and you want to support me, you know how you can do it. Like I say it all the time, surely no one here is new, but if, if you're new, there is an about section on this YouTube channel where you can find a link to coffee, which is where people can, if they can, and they want to, send me five pounds a month. And for five pounds a month, I am able to just do everything I do for free. The home ed lessons and the IGCSE lessons and this, what is this? I don't know, just like Lego and fun times. <laughs> so thank you very much everyone who's supporting me. Children, don't you be clicking any links, by the way. Let, let the adults do it. All right, I'm gonna go on Facebook because uh, I did put up a post saying if you wanted to risk it, because YouTube's been really sticky, but if you want to come over to YouTube and see the show, then you can leave me any questions here. Let's see if anyone's left me any questions. I'm thinking that people might have just given up on YouTube now, but it's working fine. That's good. It's just a, I say, you know, I'm doing a lot of lessons now on Facebook and YouTube, and there are going to be like hours where maybe their lives are a bit sticky. So we are going to hit them, unfortunately, but. It seems to be a rare thing. Oh, I can't. Ah, oh, Suki and Asa and Eunice are here. You came back. Oh, thanks, you lot. Oh, that's nice to see you. Oh, and there's Eleanor. Oh, Eleanor says, did you know NASA crashed a spacecraft into an astronaut on purpose? Oh, yes, I did. Thank you. Oh, yeah, we missed that, didn't we? Yeah, NASA crashed a spacecraft into an asteroid on purpose as a test for defending Earth. That is so cool. I must admit, I only found out on the day. Eleanor, thank you for telling us that. Yeah, apparently it's the first time, isn't it, that humans have like drastically altered the trajectory of a of a big thing in the universe. It's just, yeah, amazing. Space is great, isn't it? I'm super excited actually that that it didn't launch. Although I'm sad because they must have lost loads of money. Because now I get to. It's so much more fun, isn't it, watching an event happen when you've actually learned about it. All right. Oh, thank you for telling me that you're watching. It's very nice to see you. Okay. Uh, I'm gonna go and start planning next week's lessons. Thank you so much for coming and for all your support people. I'll see you soon.